Hey, what's up guys? In this video, I want to show you what my process is for taking a mesh that we modeled in Blender and then optimizing it for use in a game engine. So it's a very straightforward process and I just want to give you a, a very straightforward example. So I'm not going to do it for this entire door right here. I'm just going to do it for a piece of it because the same theory applies to the whole thing. So what I'm going to do here is um, basically just let me delete everything else out and we'll just start here. So say you have a model, you have a piece like this or whatever, and you want to prepare this and make it a game ready asset. You want to make it lower poly, remove areas that can be baked, things like that. Now the first thing you want to do before you even start is you want to duplicate this piece and add it into its own collection. So I have a high poly collection here, then we can make a new collection and just call it low. And what I generally do is I press shift D to duplicate, right click, and then I press M to move it to the low poly collection. And then we can just go ahead and hide that high poly collection. And now we have a backup, so if we want to bake it, we have that piece for baking, and we can get to work on this one. So the very first thing we want to do, the very first thing, do not forget this, is you want to remove any detail that can be baked. Two reasons for this. One, if you were to unwrap all this detail that could otherwise be baked, this is taking up unnecessary UV space that could otherwise be used more optimally, optimally and uh, of course be used for a higher resolution texture. So, you know, see all these little details right here. I could leave them in if I wanted to, but we're going to have one, more poly count because it's more geometry, and two, it's going to occupy UV space that could otherwise be used a bit more efficiently. So this is what I tell people when they're like, you don't need to worry about poly count anymore, you don't need to make a low poly. Well, that's not completely true because uh, even if Unreal Engine has the world's best, um, you, you can have as many polygons as you want, right? Let's say you can. Um, that doesn't take away from the fact that all that extra little detail that you chose to not bake, it's taking up UV space. So although you might not, not have to worry about the poly count, what you do need to worry about is your texturing and, you know, materials and draw calls and optimizing that UV space is still important even though the UV, or um, I'm sorry, the poly count might not matter as much anymore. So this is why I'm on the side of simply removing the little details that you can otherwise bake. And the best way to determine what you can remove is, does it define the form? So for example, if I go through all these live booleans we have here, this piece here could technically be baked, it's on a flat surface, but it's a very massive piece, which means the bake would probably be fairly obvious. So in this case, I would actually apply this boolean. Let's go to the next one not sure what that is let's go to this one this is kind of defining the form so this one we don't want to bake let's go to these this one is also defining the form it's a cutout we want to apply that these are just on a flat surface these little details could easily be baked in so instead of applying it I'm going to remove it like that same for these little tiny bolts up here we can remove those this one right here you might be able to bake it, but the issue if you tried to bake this one is you'd have a line cutting through where it's kind of hollow here. So I would actually apply this one. I don't like to compromise quality. This one we have to apply, and then this one we probably want to apply as well. So this is the general strategy. You remove any booleans that you, um, you can bake, and you apply any booleans that define the form. So here we're not really worrying about the poly count at all. We're simply worrying about optimizing that UV space. By definition, removing more geometry on your mesh means less area has to be unwrapped, right? And that's generally how it's going to work. So um, that's specifically why I still say, you know, making a quote unquote low poly is important because you still want to unwrap and bake to really optimize that texture space. Cool. So now at this point is where we can kind of have the little debate about do you want a true low poly or do you not? I don't care what you choose to do, that one's up to you. I'll show you both solutions. So if you're maybe using a different game engine or you want a true low poly asset, you want to make this as low poly as possible, the first thing you want to do is you want to go to your bevel modifier, set the segment count to one. You're going to see it looks basically the same 
there's not too much of a difference, but the poly count, the tri count goes from about 9,000 all the way down to 4,600. And that's a pretty big difference, that's about double. And that was simply by dropping the segment count down to one. And the reason it's really affecting it is because all these little bevels, notice how you know, they have three segments, but we're turning them all down to one right there. So that's the first step if you want to make a true low poly object. The next step here is making your bevels lower resolution, the defining bevels here. So at this point, if you're, if you're like me, you probably have some pretty rounded bevels on your mesh. So basically what you would do is you'd hold Alt and Shift click and just kind of go through here and dissolve out every other one. This is why I recommend making your bevel counts even so that way you don't have to compromise on the holding bevel edge. And you can just go in here and press Control X to dissolve those out. And notice how it doesn't really change the curvature all that much. So that's why I would recommend dissolving those out. Now, if I want another step and I try to dissolve it, it's going to get pretty faceted. So you have to determine if that's worth it to you or not. I'm just going to go ahead and leave it like that. But basically, you would go around to all your bevels here and just dissolve out every other edge and just make sure you're still holding the curvature. You're not like making it super faceted or anything. So, yeah, that's what you can do. Go around to all those bevels there and um, just uh, make it less round, really. And that is what you would do if you want a true low poly asset. You decimate down those bevels as far as you possibly can and that's going to be your low poly asset once you're done with that. Now, if you're one of the ones who aren't super concerned about that extra geometry count, maybe you're popping it into Unreal Engine or whatever, then it's totally fine to just leave these bevels at the, uh, at the highest resolution and just not worry about them at all. So if you were to do that, if you were to just ignore all these bevels, you're going to see the poly count here with a bevel modifier is about 4600. Now, if I did make this low poly, which I'll do off camera, I'll tell you what the number is when I do that. So after decimating down all these bevels here, you're gonna see it basically looks the same before and after. I was able to knock that down an additional 2000 tries. So it's kind of a matter of, do you wanna spend all that time decimating it down? or uh, do you just want to take the higher poly count? And a lot of people nowadays are probably just going to opt for the higher poly count, and that's fine, but um, you know, it's your choice. You choose what you want to do. So whatever path you choose to go down, the next step is equally as important. What you want to do is um, it's really easy to unwrap hard surface meshes, even if they have N-Gons. People are saying you can't unwrap with N-Gons, and I have absolutely no clue where they're getting their information from, but you can absolutely unwrap end guns. And I just made a three and a half hour long video like uh, last week or something showing that specifically. And let me show you how you do it. It's really easy. What you wanna do is you wanna go up here to select and then select the sharp edges. And these are the areas where you wanna mark your seams. All the sharp hard edges are where you mark your seams. So we're gonna press Control E and then mark the seam and I'll just pop on a, um, a UVs material here and just kind of see how it looks. So we just go to the shader editor, add in an, an image texture, and then we go to 4096, 4K, UV grid, and then connect it up to the base color. Then we're just gonna go in here, and you're gonna see the unwrap is totally fine. It doesn't matter if it's quads or engons here, it's fine. It's literally a, a clean unwrap here. So we're just gonna make sure it actually unwrapped fully, which it did, and you can see no real issues. Now this is once again where the paths kind of split off. Some people um, might be totally cool with this and aren't too worried about the seam. Seams aren't like something you need to overly stress about unless they're crazy obvious. So a lot of people would just mark these seams on all the hard edges and, and then call it a day, but um, you probably could do some work if you wanted to spend an additional few minutes just removing seams that you don't really need to have marked like especially on these chamfers here what I could easily do is um, keep one seam along the chamfer then the other part of the chamfer I could just clear it from and it's just going to make the UVs a little bit more clean and I'd always recommend trying to clean up your UVs if you can and just getting a somewhat more decent result right is it essential well of course not but this is why I said this is once again where the paths kind of branch off and people can make their own decisions as to what is important for them. So you can kind of come in here and start removing some seams that are kind of unnecessary and, uh, you know, doing things that way. 
or you can just kind of leave it as it is and trust that the seams won't be too obvious, which they, uh, they probably won't be, especially if you're using like a grungy material. So once you've done your unwrapping, the, the next step here is to simply, well, uh, triangulate your mesh. Now, um, you want to triangulate your mesh if it's an N-GON mesh. And generally, a hard surface, Boolean bevel-based workflow does have N-GONs. If you have very consistent quads like organic shapes would have, um, those are going to triangulate automatically with pretty much zero issue. But when you have, you know, N-GONs kind of like this on your mesh, you can't just export it and hope it works. You need to triangulate it, otherwise it's um, not going to display properly in your engine of choice. Fortunately, Blender has made this incredibly easy. You can just go here to the Modifiers panel and add on a Triangulate modifier. And Blender's Triangulate modifier is amazing because it actually triangulates in areas that do not cause artifacts, do not cause overlap. So rest assured, when you add this triangulation, it's not going to distort anything. It's going to triangulate it in the areas that matter most. So it's just very important you pop one of these on. Um, you know, if you're kind of worried about how large these N-Gons are and how far these triangulations kind of go across the mesh, another thing you could easily do is kind of, you know, split up these N-Gons a bit. You could just kind of cut through here and do things that way. Do I think it's necessary in this case? Eh, probably not. But if you wanted to just kind of ease the tension on how far these triangulations pull, then you could easily just kind of split up the N-Gons a bit and do it that way. But this is a static you know, game asset. It's not going to be deformed or anything like that. And you could actually animate it. Like if you wanted to animate the door opening and closing, since you're animating the whole thing together, the topology doesn't matter there. If you were to animate like, you know, the vertices and how those deform, different, different story. Or if you're doing VFX work, um, you'd have to have, you know, very consistent quad-based geometry because if you wanted it to like explode into a million pieces, um, the end gons like this are not going to cut it. It's not going to work. I don't do any VFX work when people come to me asking for VFX um, you know, projects or want me to make a mesh for it. I, I don't do it. It's, I'm not interested. So uh, yeah, I mean, for a static game asset, this is totally a uh, fine solution and most of you are going to be going that route anyways. If you were working in VFX and you know you had to make this all quads and clean, you could do a few things. You could try running a quad remesher. It's a pretty expensive tool, but if you're going to be working in VFX making hard surface assets, it's probably going to be a good investment. Um, basically, we could let's just try like, I don't know, 10,000 here, detect the hard edges by angle. And, um, you know, Quadri Mesher actually has came a very far way in terms of, um, you know, retopologizing things. I mean, look at that. It is just amazing. There are some kind of areas of tension here and you can generally play with the settings to get something that works a bit better so those are for you quadders out there <laughs> there you go that's when you need quads right uh, for what i'm doing i do not need quads and I, I rarely ever need them in cases like this cool so that is the next step after you've unwrapped it you want to get your triangulation going and if you do need quads for your line of work um, you're going to have to retopologize that manually or just run quad remesher and play with the settings there but for anyone yelling at me otherwise for the lack of quads, I mean, you're, you're just incorrect. I mean, not much more I can say there. For a static game asset, it, it's not a big deal. Triangulate it. You're good. Cool. So at this point, you're essentially done. You don't need to do anything else. This mesh is ready to be brought into Substance Painter or whatever you choose to texture it in. So um, generally what I would do if I was baking from a high poly is I would go to the high poly and also add a triangulate modifier to the high poly. And that's very easy to do. I'll quickly, quickly show you. You would just go to the high poly. Um, we'd apply all of our booleans in this case, and we'd keep the baked detail because that'll be baked in. And we would just pop on a triangulate modifier and call it a day. And we do that by going to the high poly mesh here. And then we just add a triangulate modifier to that really easy. You can click on the keep normals button as well just to make sure the shading's good. And then you would basically just rename it to asset underscore high, which I've already done. And we want to go to file, export FBX, and I want to export this one. I've already exported them off camera, but you would name this one asset underscore high and 
click on selected objects and export that. And then this one would be asset underscore low. And what we would do is we go to file, export FBX, selected objects ticked on. This one would be called asset underscore low. And then you can just go into either a baking engine or straight into a texturing engine. So I'm going to be baking in Substance Painter simply because a lot of people wanted to see that. I do prefer Marmoset Toolbag because it has better baking results, but um, Substance also is pretty good for baking in my experience. So what we need to do is we need to go to File, New, 4K Document Resolution, and then we're going to load in that asset underscore low. And what we want to do is click on the OK button. That's just going to load in. Now um, you're going to see the mesh renders fine. Now, if we didn't have the triangulate modifier added in Blender, you would get one of two things. You get a completely normal mesh that managed to go into Substance Painter with no issue, or you might get a crazy collapsed mesh that didn't work. This is why a lot of people get confused when they export their models that are full of n-gons, and it just works. They're like, okay, great, it works. Then they go to another model, and it's just a collapsed mesh, and people are just confused. And the reason being is because they were doing it wrong the whole time. They just got lucky. Each of these engines have different triangulation algorithms. And Blender, um, Blender has a good one that doesn't cause overlaps, which is why you always want to do your triangulations with the modifier in Blender beforehand, just to make sure you don't get any collapsed geometry. You might get lucky, but um, generally you're going to get some bad results, which is why you want to have that triangulate modifier inside of Blender and it'll get um, applied upon export anyways. Okay, cool. So now we have this, and basically if we wanted to bake from our high poly that we made, we would need to go to our texture set settings, bake mesh maps, and I'm gonna bake the normal. You can bake an ID map if you have that. I don't. You wanna bake your ambient occlusion and your curvature. Position and thickness we don't really need here. For the most part, you want normal ambient occlusion and curvature ticked on. We're going to bake at 4K, and we want to select our high definition mesh here, which is asset underscore high. And you'd basically just go to bake selected textures. And then you just wait for this thing to bake. You're going to see it calculates everything very nicely. And, um, you know, these details get baked in. Now, sometimes um, you do get some pretty nasty results in substance. And situations like this are where I simply prefer Marmoset Toolbag because Marmoset give some superior results. I'll quickly show you. Here's what it would look like inside of Marmoset Toolbag. This is why I tell everyone I prefer to bake in Marmoset, but a lot of people wanted to see how you do it in Substance, so um, that's how you do it. If you want to learn how to bake in Marmoset, just go go to my um, longer video I made on that door and just skip to the Marmoset baking section and you'll see it all in there. Um, but yeah, this is precisely why you want to bake in Marmoset, because you get crazy results like this in Substance. And um, maybe there's some settings I can click on in here that might remove that effect, but uh, I'm not going to bother with it right now. Could be an issue with averaging normals. I think I read an article on this um, not too long ago, actually, on 80.lv. I can't remember for the life of me where it was, but probably some sort of averaging normals issue. But I mean, why... Go through all the settings when Marmoset does the job quite well. Anyways, at this point, you're basically ready to go in here and pop on some materials. So if you wanted like a, I don't know, a steel material for the door, do like a steel stained. Right, you just pop this on. And there you go. Maybe we could do something like this. But yeah, anyways, that is the general workflow that you use to prepare an asset in Blender and you know bring it into substance and texture it if you wanted to put this into a game engine or whatever so at this point you can just play with the materials as you please i'm not really going to bother with that in this video you can just go watch a substance painter tutorial but that is exactly how you do it so that's about it hope it helped and um, just let me know if you want any more videos on stuff like this or any areas that kind of confuse you also, make sure you pick up our game asset guide on our website. It's free. It kind of goes through the different steps that you need to make sure your mesh is ready um, as a game asset. So that's about it. Thanks for watching. See you soon.